Father, we thank you for your watch here over your people. We ask that you would guide, direct and bless us in the meditation and study of your word. As we come to the end of this camp meeting, we ask for continued blessings upon your people. And ask for these in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. At this CAD meeting, we have been discussing a number of issues. And as is my normal custom, I wanted to continue our education. So I made the effort to frame our discussion using parable methodology. If you are like me, then it will be a continual surprise to discover that everything we do uses parable methodology. From my perspective, parables are the foundation to understand this message. This is not a new phenomena, but it's become clearer as the years have progressed. And if you are not comfortable with parable teaching, then what you will do is make mistakes. Light will appear to be darkness, and darkness will appear to be light. And what you will what will happen to you, the trap that you will fall into, is while professing to be a studier of truth, a student of prophecy, you will find yourself systematically rejecting the midnight crime message. All of us are intelligent. All of us claim to worship God and desire the truth. So ask yourself, why do so many people fall off the narrow path into the wicked world below? I want to interject a point. In the recent past perhaps not very recent, I've discussed the following point that I'm about to make. And I've discussed it more than once. What does the world look like? It's not sex, drugs and alcohol. 
That's not what the world is. The world is right-wing, conservative Protestantism. And the hand that it reaches over when it connects with Catholicism and spiritualism. It's a conservative ideological worldview. That's what the world is. We'll simplify it. If you went to Revelation 17 verse 5, the woman had daughters. She was the mother of harlots. We'll simplify that. Apostate Protestants, Protestantism. Revelation 13. The beast that comes out of the earth speaks like a dragon. There's a transformation that occurs from Protestantism to apostate Protestantism. If you are not clear what the world is, you will have no idea if you've fallen into it. This is very important to understand. If you think worldliness is a woman wearing sleeveless tops, wearing skin tight trousers, or someone drinking coffee, or smoking marijuana, or whatever. Any, whatever kind of vice you might think about. This is not the prophetic definition of the world. It's a literal definition of the world. You could argue that. But we're supposed to be students of prophecy. So I want us to be absolutely clear on that point. If you fall into the world, you're not falling into the arms of alcohol. You're not watching movies or going to a bar. This is an incorrect literal understanding of the world. And it's completely wrong. It's not fit for purpose. If you ask the wrong question, you will get the wrong answer. If you have the wrong assumptions or parameters for an experiment, your answers will be like a self-fulfilling prophecy. This is really important to understand. If you set up the parameters wrong, you will always get the wrong answers. I'll try to hold on to that point so I don't confuse you because I want to come back to it.
Why did I speak about the wicked world? Why have I defined again what the world is? I just called it apostate Protestantism. We'll give it another name. Elder Tess's presentation number one. I think the words that she, the phrase that she used was the following. The institution of Adventism. Contrary to popular belief, the conference structure, the SDA church, the institution, whatever phrase you will use, is not a liberal church. It's a conservative church. And conservative means they go through all of their rituals. They hold on to their traditional values. Don't be foolish. Don't look at the church. Look at history. Look at prophecy, because they're the same thing. Go back to the line, we'll call it the line of Christ, the line of Ephesus. And you can see very clearly that that church, the church when Christ was alive, was a conservative church. So I hope I've made my point there. Now, what do conservative people do? How do they behave? Where do they get their moral framework from? What were the opponents of Jesus constantly doing? What are they carrying under their arms that they would pull out and make reference to? The Word. The reason why I make this point, I think it was yesterday, I spoke about a narrow path and two, ditch two ditches. One of those ditches, I said, was, the, was that people stopped opening their Bibles. And people were concerned that if they have stopped opening their Bibles, perhaps they are lost because they've fallen into the world. Prophetically, if you had fallen into the world, you would now go into your Bible and you would begin to wax eloquent. You would talk with power and eloquence about a thus saith the Lord. You would desire to prove all things and hold fast that which is true. Because you would argue that you need to follow a thus saith the Lord.
which is where all of the people who have left this movement end up. It's not good that people are not studying their Bibles now. But there is hope for you. More hope than those people who fall into conservatism or into the wicked world. And as I said yesterday, this, ph this phenomena is a prophetic issue. It's not some individualistic problem that we have. Or that you might have if I'm talking to you. So, we've been using parable teaching... And we have used it in the framework of two concepts. Ideology and humanism. They will lead you in different directions. One will lead you into dominionism or the the idea that you are special the problem in our movement we have too many people who think that they're special they want to be special but the truth is if you follow God's leading you will increasingly find yourself to be not special. And I chose to use the word worthless. In the words of C.S. Lewis, this is mere Christianity. nothing special we then developed our study and we spoke about the power and the necessity of rhetoric if you want to be wise Rev, um, Daniel 12 then you need to understand the art of rhetoric. Rhetoric is persuasion. You need to persuade people of what the truth is. Now, we then develop this idea And said, rhetoric has three components. Logos, ethos, pathos. And I gave very simple definitions for each of those three components. Reason. Morality, feelings. The reason why it's important to understand that is because when you deal particularly with Logos and Ethos
these ideas fall squarely into the realm of ideology. Logos means opinion, your account, your version. Ethos, we have said, means moral. And when we talk about morality, we need to understand the framework of that moral. And what you will find is that Morals change depending on a person's perspective. And so, particularly Logos and Ethos end up being more about your opinion than they are about the truth. Objective truth, universal truth, one thing that the American Revolution got correct when they spoke in the Declaration of Independence They understood one thing, that human beings have inalienable rights, that means rights that cannot be taken from them, they are there by virtue of being human. So an, in, an inalienable right is something that you have just because you're human. It's not something that someone can give to you. It's your birthright. By the fact that you are a human being. Now they codified it in three simple Concepts Life Freedom Property They phrased it slightly differently Life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness But it means the freedom to live, it means to actually have freedom, the first one we should say the right to live, not the freedom to live, the right to live. The right to be free, and they say pursuit of happiness. But it really means the ability to gain property. Or to collect or own things. And they can be material and immaterial. So... This was an 18th century concept of a universal declaration of human rights. Three articles. But of course, as we all know,
America was not true to its principles. From the very beginning, it introduced God into its systems or institutions of government. And that's where it failed. The French, on the other hand, Because they came from a different, their past was different, they came from a different heritage, they were created in a different crucible, a crucible is a furnace, they came up with different conclusions. And they were much truer to the principles of, we will call it, equality. Time moves on. First World War, Second World War. All of that history happened because of people's ideological beliefs. So in 1948, 46 to 48, The United Nations developed a new charter or a new declaration of human rights. I'm just trying to look for something, one moment. Go to Revelation chapter 18. Verse 24. This is not directly connected to our study. But I want to just add this point in. We'll read. And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. Now we don't have time to do a study on this verse. So I'll answer my own questions. Who is the her? Go back to verse 21. The great city Babylon. That is the her. And then it says, In her, in Babylon, was found the blood of everyone who has ever died. Now come on, let's think. We know that not the blood of every saint, of every human being is found in Babylon. So 
So you need to understand how to read that verse. And this is the problem. Revelation 18 verse 24. The problem is that we don't read properly. I want to leave one thought with you. That I or someone else will pick up in the future. The Bible speaks from a certain perspective. Now you might think that the Bible is a principled book. I want to argue differently. It's not a book full of principles. Now that may surprise you that I think that way. I want to suggest that rather than being a book of principles, it's a book of examples. I'll give you one example of that example. Right here. Number four. God. Sabbath. There we are. Revel um, Deuteronomy chapter 20. Now, are the Ten Commandments, are they immortal? Are they going to be with us forever? Are they outside of time? We know that ca that cannot be. Just read the language and it screams at you. But we'll make one simple point. The Sabbath is not immutable. It cannot be. Because when was the Sabbath created? How old is it? It's not immutable. The Bible was, sorry, the Sabbath was made for humans. Humans were not made for the Sabbath. You can get many things from that verse. But one thing that you get. What comes first? What comes first? Human or Sabbath? It's clear. The Sabbath was made for humans, so humans must have been there first. So what you may think as being principles. Immutable truths. End up becoming examples. And you. Once you. Once you are awakened to this reality. Two things will happen. It will open your eyes to scripture in a way that you never saw before. Which should inspire you to go back to your Bibles. And I've forgotten the second reason. So we'll just go with the one. So I 
want to suggest that the Bible is a book that's full of examples. Even though it frames itself as being a book of principles. I can tell people don't believe me. I'll give you one more example because on the testimony of two a point is established. I said Deuteronomy, I meant Exodus, of course. <laughs> Exodus 20. I apologise for that. Ten Commandments, Exodus 20. I gave the example of the Sabbath. Now, I don't know about the Sabbath in the future... That's, I'm not arguing that point. What I am saying, it, it, it had a beginning. That's the point I want to make. So, if we'll go with the Ten Commandments. If the Ten Commandments were immutable principles, now do we all know what the word covet means when you covet something? I'll give a basic definition. This is my definition. It means you desire, you are jealous of something that belongs to someone else. To someone else is the neighbour. So when I am jealous, when I desire what my neighbour has, I'm coveting. So if this is a principle, then that means your neighbour owns his wife. And your neighbour owns the souls of servants. So we have sexism and slavery tucked right into the Tenth Commandment. Let's be clear, that neighbour is a man. That man owns a lot of things. I want us to see that Get the book right. Exodus 20 verse 17. It's not a principle. It's an example. And if you go. Over and over again through inspiration. You will see the same. Is it a principle that women should not vote? Of course it's not, but we treat it as though it is. I hope we have all overcome the following. That there is no principle that women have to wear skirts or dresses. That's not a principle. Why am I labouring this point? Because when we start talking about ethos and we start talking about morality 
you need to be clear that much of this is your opinion. We won't say that because you don't like that. We'll go to the other word. It's someone's account of what morality is. Which makes it contextual. Which makes it an example, not a principle. And that's why here it says universal. And here it says account or opinion. So an ideology is someone's viewpoint. It's not universal. And this movement is being dragged backwards against its will to move away from an ideological perspective to a universal perspective. And no matter what continent you are on, we are finding members, both men and women, who don't believe that the Bible is full of examples, who are not willing to give up their ideological viewpoints, and to abandon the concept of dominionism. I could say, we're just waiting for them to leave the movement, But they've already left. They're here in body, but not in spirit. Not all of Israel is Israel. You need to be very careful. Because when people say, Let's open the word of God and see a thus saith the Lord on what Paminder is teaching. Because we all want to study for ourselves. It sounds exciting. It sounds tantalizing. Seductive. Your ears will tingle. But be on guard. Be on guard for those people who quote inspiration and they know nothing about what they're talking of. We still have elements of that in our movement. And you need to be on guard when those people speak to take caution. Now I want to address an important point. It's the development what I've, of what I've taught for a long time. But unless I develop it and explain it, people just don't get the issue. People think they're too clever. We'll call it worldly wisdom. And what is the world? Conservative. It's so it's conservative wisdom.
Paul was a conservative when he was Saul. There's a line, a demarcation. The old man and the new man. When I was a child, I was very childish. But when I grew up, I put away childish behaviour. And what is childish behaviour? What does that even mean? What is Paul talking about? He said, The time has now come that you are supposed to be teachers. School. Who are the teachers? The children or the adults? We all know the answer. He says the time has now come where you are supposed to be teachers. But what we find is that you who are supposed to be teachers need to be taught yourselves. In parentheses, because you're still children, you have not grown up. What have they not grown up in? What book are we even talking about? It's the book of Hebrews. This is a book that's directed to the Hebrews. And what's the whole subject of the book of Hebrews all about? One issue. It's on the board. It's right here. The sanctuary. And with a sanctuary you need a priest. So you might have said the subject of Hebrews is Jesus. I would argue it's the sanctuary. And the need to have a priest to take care of that facility. So when he rebukes them and he says your children. It's because they don't understand the development of truth. When you read the writings of Paul. What does he do over and over again? He takes the scriptures and twists them. People don't like me using those kinds of words like twist and manipulate. But he does that. Just study and see for yourselves. Now, I want to ask you a question. On the day of Pentecost, who got the Holy Spirit? Rank and file members of the church or the disciples? Laodiceans or Ephesians? You know the answer. The tongues of fire fell on the Ephesians, not the Laodiceans. The speaking in tongues came, the power was in the mouth, not in the ear. The Laodiceans didn't have special ears that they can understand things. The gift was given to the disciples. So, when Paul is now going to explain what is happening in the world, in the church, in his generation. He 
he has to use line upon line methodology which is parable teaching and you know why parable teaching is used to stop people from understanding except the elect which is the special people we'll leave that to another discussion the point I want to make it takes a rhetor to do parables to understand them so I want to make the following assertion There are many people that Paul evangelizes. The Gentiles and the Jews. We'll go with the Jews. Now the Jews are spread all over the world. When he goes to a Jewish city, when he goes to a city and he engages with the local Jews there why do they reject him? what's the reason? it's because of the way they study they don't understand how parables work they don't understand the difference between principle and example Paul does. That's why he can go into the Old Testament, which is an example, and give another example. If those Old Testament passages were principles, he would be doing sin. Is Sodom a precept or an example? an example because a few years later who becomes Sodom the Jewish nation a few years later who becomes Sodom the nation of France these are examples they're not principles There are all of these Jewish people all doomed to die because they don't know how to read and they cannot read by themselves. There's one special group, unique group. The Bereans. Now the Bereans are special. They're more noble than all the other Jews. Because they understand the methodology that Paul is using. They're not using conventional wisdom. They are not rejecting the message. They have accepted the principles that Paul has given. So even though the Bible says they checked things for themselves. That's not as true as you might think. Because if you don't use Paul's methodology, the Bereans don't know anything, they could never discover anything.
we use this term about Bereans in a very glib and casual way. Glib means loosely. Most people who claim to be Bereans are not Bereans. The Bereans were honourable above all people. They were obedient to the messenger. And, I re and the reason I know that is all the evidence I've already just given you. Because if you study the Bible using a thus saith the Lord, if you're not a Berean, you need to use the same methodology that Paul uses. Which means you need to understand how the Bible is constructed. And for a Berean who doesn't know their right hand from their left hand, they're not the disciples. They're not being given the message. They have not had the Holy Spirit poured upon them. All they can do is copy Paul. And when they copy him, of course they'll get to the same answer. And that's what makes them different to everyone else. And people misuse the concept and the idea of being a Berean. It's not independent thinking, which is how people use them. It's like William Miller. When he speaks about those people who go to these cemeteries. And I've discussed this in previous presentations. It's the people like Lazarus who sit at the feet of the messenger. Or Mary. Not like Martha, who wants to figure out things her own way. She's not the one who receives the benefit or the blessing. Now why is this all important? It's because it's all to do with an ideological perspective. which has contextual morals based upon your perspective. Or whether you're going to be more universal. Whether you're going to accept that human beings have inalienable rights. Americans are stuck in a time warp. They have three articles and the rest of the world has 30. I hope you get that parable. The rights today are an order of magnitude greater Order of magnitude means times 10. From 3 to 30. Now of course, you know that's only a parable. Because we already discussed who the architect for the universal 30 articles was. It was the first.
first lady. First lady of the United States. And I think that is a beautiful concept to consider. They gave us three. And then it got multiplied to 30. What's unfortunate is that worldly people, my definition, our definition, which is conservative Christianity, They don't believe that people have universal rights. A book has been recommended. I hope I get the name correct. The New Jim Crow. And what that means, in essence, is you go from slavery to manipulating minorities and when they got when that got discovered they just changed like a chameleon and then you got the new Jim Crow the new oppression. So even though America understands about universal rights, apostate Protestantism does not. And remember, we read Revelation 18, 24. Babylon has got everybody's blood. Not literally, of course. And that's the point. Apostate Protestantism and its problems... in a global or universal world is not the premier problem it's an example of the problem and there are equally other ideologies that are as problematic Our problem is the way we read. When we have examples, first in the United States, then the rest of the world will follow. That's not a principle, it's an example of a fulfillment that would have happened, could have happened. But what we do is we take that statement and we turn it into a principle. A principle is a law that endures over time and circumstance. It doesn't change. And therein lies the problem. If you take these examples as principles, you get into a problem. And I want us to understand how easy it is to make mistakes. Now, the I don't know what number we're at. 
But another part of the study that we had this at this cat meeting was to discuss an important evolving principle. Our understanding of our own humanity. So it was only a brief discussion on one aspect of our humanity. And that is the relationship between nature and nurture. Genetics or environment. And I wanted us to be very clear. If you don't believe that you were educated and trained to be heterosexual, not logic, but parable teaching will show you that people who are LGBTQ, they are also driven by their nature and they're not making choices and therefore it's a false model to believe that if you're surrounded by homosexual people whether they're your parents or your teachers that they will make you homosexual. There is no science behind that. Only conspiracy theories which find a home with people who have ideological beliefs. If you hold on to the principle of universal rights It's like the man who sweeps out the mind of that demon-possessed person. All these conspiracy theories will be swept away from your mind. They cannot gain ground as long as you hold on to universal rights. And what I would recommend to you, particularly those of you who have lost interest in studying the Bible, is to pick up your Bibles again and begin to look for principles in these examples. Try to understand what the principles are behind the Ten Commandments, for example. How does coveting work? How does the Sabbath work? How does worship work? The more you're able to do this, the more you're able to understand how to look at an example and develop a principle the more you will begin to think like Paul and then it can be said of you you are indeed honourable a Berean Let's pray.
our Heavenly Father, it's our prayer, our request, that you would guide, direct and bless us in the meditation and in the study of your word. Teach us the true principles of prophetic study. May we not rely upon flesh, upon human wisdom, upon the sons of Aaron, but rather may we turn to Melchizedek. We cannot say his son, but we can say Jesus Christ who was created after the order of Melchizedek and not only him but all those faithful priests in this movement who also stand in their own righteousness and preach the message with fidelity, with power, with truth. May each of us desire to be noble, a true Berean. We ask this request in Jesus' name. Amen.